just to start the ball rolling, we've got a quick fire round for each of our guests. So two questions each, answer them quickly as you can. Um, but we're all really curious to know what the answers are as well. So Kate, let's start with you. Um, what kind of swimming have you been up to so far this year? Oh, huge variety. That's going to be difficult to do uh, really um, short, but I've been abroad. So I've been swimming over coral reefs in cenotes in huge great rivers in America um, and learning butterfly and I'm working on my front crawl with a lot of jumping in with my kids to add to that as well. I feel like we're going to be quite jealous of your adventures so far, Kate, based on that. And second question, the temperature has taken a bit of a downward turn. So what's your way of, of getting into the water now that it's quite cold out there? Reluctantly. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, um, I'm as of two weeks ago, I am now trying to work on building up my internal fire before I get in. I'm actually amongst the OSS members quite um, well known for not really being very good at cold and not particularly fond of it either. But I just can't miss my swimming. So, yeah, I'm now working on a new kind of uh, Qigong uh, routine, which looks quite ridiculous, but it's quite fun um, in the hope of warming myself up both before and after my swim. Right, interesting. I think I might have seen some of that on your Instagram account. So if anyone wants to know what's going on there, follow and, you. And also, also a bit like a sort of, you know, a, ten a tennis player having all these little adjustments that they do before they serve. I've got that sort of thing before water. I like to get in. I put my hands in. I kind of dab water on my cheeks, on my chest and yeah. all the places that might make you gasp and then do one big long and then go it's a kind of you know once I've done the exhale then I kind of the path is set and I'm getting in well I feel like we need to find out what everyone else's techniques are so Callum how do you go about getting into cold water well for me I think the key is personally not too much faffing so I've made my plan <clears throat> I've got all my gear for my swimming ready I've got all my gear for when I get out of the water ready <laughs> I know exactly where it's going to be uh, a lot of it for me is deciding before I get in the water committing to it so once my feet are wet, I'm not stopping. I'm just continuing walking in. And I know it's going to hurt. I know it's going to be cold. And similar to Kate, it's that one big breath really to get the chest and to get the neck under. But the key for me is no faffing about beforehand is to decide you're going to do it and then commit to it. You mean business when you're going swimming. It's, it's, that's straight in. That's what we're doing now. I think so. I think when it's colder, it's much more of a, a psychological battle just to get in the water. Mm -hmm. However, uh, it gives you a much bigger lift when you've got over that mental hurdle just to do it. So I think uh, part of the challenge this time of year and into winter as well is just actually getting in the water. So for me, it's about decide because I've done it for a few years as well. Yeah. I know how it's going to hurt, but I just decide I'm going to do it and uh, embrace it no matter what. And what about you? What what kind of swimming have you been enjoying this year? Cold water recently, but has it been like that all year? Uh, I make sure mainly in Scotland, so mainly <laughs> it's not been the warmest, I've got to say. Um, I had a plan. A lot of my swimming plans didn't really work out this year, very down to injury and then a bit of illness as well. Um, so maybe my plans from this year are going to roll on to next year. I want to I do a lot of lo local exploring around my area. I've got lots of big lochs here um, that I want to start doing um, the length of, you know, swimming from A to B right to the end of. Uh, I had a few lined up this year but it didn't quite work out for various reasons so I'm just going to roll over to next year. Fantastic well I look forward to following your adventures and Owen what about you what what swimming have you been enjoying over 2022? So for the past two years I was living down in Surrey uh, uh, working at RHS Wisley the garden and I uh, and it has this river that flows right the way along the edge of the garden and I lived in the student accommodation just on the edge of the site and we literally had the river at the, at the foot of our garden. So I just became totally obsessed with swimming in that. I'm not joking, three or four times a day. I'd get up straight in the river, um, back home for lunch in the river, home from work in the river, quick dip just before bed. And uh, well, that was in the summer. In the winter, you know, not, not so much. Um, I didn't hardly use the shower, um, to be honest. And, and also I was amazing at kind of, everyone would be ready to go. We've got, you know, we need to be, we need to be in work. Uh, 10 minutes, that's plenty of time. I can have a swim and cycle to work in 10 minutes. That's no problem. So I was uh, in the river a lot and I would swim down from work, one kilometre from work back home. And uh, it would take me about 15 minutes with the flow. And then I also just went to explore that river. It's the river way. And I just went around Surrey exploring that river. Um, and then in that heat, endless heat wave that we had, 
it was just like I felt like I was in kind of Babylon. It was just magical to, to, to spend so much time in the river and get to know it from the high floods right the way through to, to the summer drought and, and the crystal clear water that you get within that in that summer. So yeah, that river, I, I formed a strong relationship with, with the river way this summer. That sounds like the most idyllic commute in the history of commutes, like just swimming down a beautiful river while the sun beats down on you. Perfect. I think there's going to be a lot of people jealous of that one as yeah. well. And, and finally, again, for you, when what's your approach, your uh, method of approaching getting into cold water now? The temperatures have dropped. I think a lot, a lot like Callum. Yeah, I have I have my kind of my, my ritual. You know, I've got I, I know what I'm doing. I've, I know how to prepare. As you say, make sure you've got, I, I like to get really nice and warm before I get in the water. I like, you know, I don't have a sauna, but the nearest thing I have to a sauna is a lot of clothes, heated seat in, in on my car. If I can do that, all the heaters on, hot water bottle. I like to be absolutely roasting, even have a little run around, have a jog. I want to break a sweat, hot as possible, and then get in. And I used to get in really slowly. I used to get in really, you know, take it easy up to the knees, up to the waist. Now I'm just like, you know, clothes off, neoprene gloves and socks on straight in the water and uh, and enjoy that. And then the warmer you are when you get in, the warmer you are when you get out. That's the way I think about it. You know, the further from hypothermia you were when you got in, the further from hypothermia you are when you get out. So hotter is better for me, definitely. I love it. I love what's also already coming out is that everybody has their own kind of approaches and experiences and preferences and loves for what you're doing so it's like it's not just one thing and it's not one size fits all for this it's everybody has has a different experience and a different perspective on this so with that in mind I think we should get stuck into some of our media questions that people have sent in and Kate we're going to kick off with you and uh, we've had a first question sent in which is perfect uh, from Sarah Holdway and Sarah wants to know how do you know where is a good spot to swim is it just word of mouth how do you find where to go swimming um a good spot and a safe spot uh, could be kind of quite close um, bedfellows. So I think, um, yeah, you can find out an awful lot from word of mouth. There's an awful lot on the media now about um, safe spots. There's lots of guidebooks and there are a lot of wild swim groups as well. So actually, it's really easy these days just using Google to get lots of ideas about where other people have swum. I guess the thing that I would add to that is that... Um, there is no such thing as a safe swim spot. There's only a safe swimmer. So, you, so it's just really important when you're thinking about a spot that you um, consider what your own swimming ability is. Obviously, no spot is safe. Um, if you, you know, going out of your depth wouldn't be safe if you can't swim. So you've really got to kind of start at the beginning of uh, what sort of spot are you looking for? Um, you know what would suit you do you want a really calm river pool or a lake where you could swim along the shore those are kind of the mellowest conditions that that you know you're likely to find uh, or are you very happy in the sea in the surf you know I think just look at your own swimming ability think about cold you know it's much easier to start swimming in summer um, it's only in the last couple of years that we've got this this kind of situation that I don't think anyone in the RSS would ever have predicted that people would start winter swimming or start swimming in in midwinter. You know, normally people build up to it with a few years of um, life in the summer. Um, and just gradually expand the kind of type of swims that you do. And if you do it that way, sort of very gently, gently, then you'll come to appreciate things like rivers rise and fall with rainfall you know, with rainfall, the tides go in and out, you know, the conditions that you meet each day in different weather is, it are going to be different. Yes, it's like some of the rivers near me, there's spots that people swim in sometimes, but you just would not go near if there's been a lot of rain, because it's just not, it's not safe to go in there at that point. <laughs> Um, and yeah, what about and can, can, can I can I can I just add to that actually you know I think that's a really really good point because I mean I've I think we probably all if anyone who's swum a lot will have come across people about to hurl themselves into a river or a pool um, because they've seen other people jumping there completely oblivious to the fact that it hasn't rained for weeks and it's now really bone crushingly shallow um, so you know the things the stuff that you find online or even in guidebooks like it, it's it's a guide but you really want to try and get yourself into a situation where where you're really thinking about it when you get there and assessing it for yourself and taking responsibility for yourself so just because you've seen it on instagram doesn't mean you start running straight into the water because the conditions might be different to when that picture or that person was swimming okay good good advice there um so we've got another question from lindsay um 
who's from Essex. So Lindsay has completed a few swims, including the Dart 10K and the Bantam Swoosh. Uh, she's just signed up for the Silly Isles Challenge. Um, her question is how, this is something I can definitely relate to. How does she overcome her fear of fish, seals and dolphins? She's really thought about it. And she thinks that she just hates the unknown and the thought of something making her jump while she's in the water. How do you switch off from that? I am listening to this because this has put me off swimming in the sea for so many years. Is that feeling that something might touch me under the water and I can't get out of the way? Um, well, I think one thing, Lindsay, excellent choice of swim events there. <laughs> and uh, and also um, I was interested in, in whatever words there were about, um, I'm convinced that I've got a deep fear of the unknown um, because actually anyone with a really deep fear of the unknown wouldn't be swimming wouldn't be able to swim. So I think give yourself some marks for bravery. Initially, there's many people who don't get in. They're so freaked out by the opaque deaths and the fact that you can't, you're so insignificant in water and you can't control um, necessarily everything that's gonna to happen to you. So I think there's, there's a lot of uh, bravery within Lindsay. And then the other thing I think, Deep water fear, I think, is really interesting because I, I personally don't think, and having talked to lots of swimmers as well, I don't think it really goes away. So obviously, Lindsay, in your case, it's focused on the actual wildlife in the water. But if you didn't have that, you might just be experiencing, you know, the sort of mythical beast fear. Or you would, even if you rationalised away the dolphins and the seals, the deep water fear might this just come up and take some other form, whether it's sort of mythical beasts or um, other strange creatures. So... Um, I would say that you're probably in a situation that most of us are in that we have to learn to lightly manage uh, the fear. And I do this in various ways, depending on like what day it is. Sometimes I count strokes. It's like a kind of in meditation where you try and push all your thoughts aside. If you think, if you just count your strokes loud enough in your head, then you don't have space to think of anything else. Um, I try and keep my thoughts very much on the surface. So when I breathe, I might be looking at the looking at well, looking at what I can see in the surface of the water and just really channeling my mind into the upper level. And actually toe floats can be quite useful in this situation because they're just something resolutely on the surface. And somehow that brings your imagination back up to that one. Um, swimming with a friend um, is, a, is a brilliant one because there's, you just, you start just being in relationship to them rather than your fears. Um, and then I guess there's just a, a friend of mine who's got the sort of feel the fear and do it anyway thing rather than trying to push the fears to one side she just sticks her head right in and just says what well, I'm doing it anyway I've just made a decision and that that's what I'm going to do and I think the Silly Isles is supposed to be an amazing swim so I really uh, I envy you that and I hope you have a good time. It sounds like it's going to be an amazing adventure and one more question before we go on to Callum um, and this is one that I think is going to be on a lot of people's minds when they're when they're thinking about sort of uh, swimming outdoors and um, water quality this is uh, sorry water quality has been in the news a lot and um, particularly recently with the uh, surface against sewage survey results that have come out today is that something that's that swimmers need to be aware of or think about before they get in the water? Um. Yes, a slightly mixed answer for this one, I think. From a, yes, you absolutely need to be aware of it. Um, it's not just uh, sewage going into water that you need to be aware of. It's also agricultural runoff. So it's a very broad kind of um, thing is to be aware that after when there's been heavy rain, a lot of swimmers might stay out for a couple of days just because of what could have washed into it. If the river level has gone up suddenly, then it's just sort of going to clean all the banks that haven't seen water for, you know, after summer, it might not have seen water for a couple of months. And then any crud that's sort of attached to them is, is going to come in there. So, um, so, yeah, definitely it pays to be aware of where the sewage outflows are. I think it's very different in different areas of the country. There's a lot of rivers that aren't anywhere near a sewage outflow. And then there's others that are really manhandled and quite um, industrial. But wherever you're swimming, there's a lot of things that you can do as a swimmer, such as um, wash your hands before you eat anything, cover up any cups before you get in. Um, like I said, avoid the water for a couple of days if there's been heavy rainfall. Do a visual assessment. I mean, honestly, it, 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 I mean, obviously it's not, you're not doing a biological test by looking at it, but you can tell quite a lot about whether water looks appealing or not. You know, you don't necessarily always need data to make some kind of judgment call. Um, be aware that the strength of your own immune system 
affects it. Like if you're feeling tired and ill, then you're going to be more vulnerable to infection um, than if you're feeling really well. And then I think the final one would um, be to weatherproof your swimming. Like you can't, a lot of people are worried about um, gastrointestinal kind of illness and getting sick, but you can't actually get sick unless you swallow it. Obviously you could get an ear infection, but you, and a lot of swimmers just don't swallow water. It's very unlikely to be going through an infection to go through the mucous membranes of your mouth and nose. So if you can breathe away from the chop, if you're not struggling even in bouncy water, you know, if you're actually able to swim in lots of different weather conditions, that's also going to help, you know, help you take on a, a wide range of conditions. Thanks, Kate. Um, and we've got loads more questions for you, which we'll come back to in just a sec. But Callum, over to you. And this links on actually nicely from Kate's question uh, in terms of sort of evaluating the kind of evaluations that you need to make before you go into the water. So what would be your advice for anyone who's looking to, you know, how do you find a new swim spot and what kind of evaluations do you do before you get into the water for the first time? Well, so in terms of finding one, um, there's lots of different ways. I think Kate was talking about there's various guides out there now. There's various, um, a really great way is to ask other swimmers. So people that swim in an area, you know, you can, and you, if you don't know the area, ask them what's good. Obviously, if they've got places that they really love, everyone's got their own kind of maybe the, their own secret that they don't want to share to the whole world. So that's understandable. But um, that's mm -hmm. a great way to find you know somewhere that people do swim at so you know it's potentially safer you know it's well used you know that people uh, may, might recognize there are swimmers there a great skill which you're not going to learn straight away but it's knowing how to read a map so knowing how to read an os map it can open up like a whole new world in terms of um finding places in rivers finding waterfalls that kind of thing I read a lot of walking and kind of kayaking blogs to get an idea maybe of somewhere that could be good. Maybe you'll see a photo and from there I'll do my research online. But really, when you get there, you want to do some research kind of on location. So the first thing I do is, like Kate says, I look, does it look clean? Does it smell? Is, is there like a smell coming off the water? Are there any obvious currents? You know, are there anything that's really obvious moving in the water, for example? Um, always look around who else is using the water you know are there boats is you know is you being visible is that going to be enough or you're going to have to maybe plan your swim so you, you don't go to an island you know if there's a regular ferry for example um choosing somewhere that's easy to get in and then back out to the water is key because especially at this time of year when it's cold getting into the water might be okay but when your feet are very cold when your hands are cold if it's like a stony surface it can be really horrible to get out so plan ahead for you know getting out to the water um, and then also other things that you might not think about straight away is um, do wildlife use the area? You know, are there lots of ducks? Try and avoid places with lots of ducks, lots of birds, for example. They can cause a thing called swimmer's itch, which is really more of a summertime thing. Um, but that's kind of it can cause a nasty rash and an itch. But really, um, it, it's choosing where you get in and out of the water is a big thing. And also, where are you going to leave your gear? Is the tie going to come in and get it? Are you happy enough that it's safe where it is? Maybe you can take all your gear with your if you're taking a tow float. These are all kind of some of the things I like to think about when I when I actually get to a place. And I like it. I love the sound of like sort of using your map skills and experience to sort of detect treasure hunts and new swim spots as well. That sounds like a proper adventure. Um, on that note, sort of a flip side of one of the questions we asked Kate, which was about sort of what do um, swimmers need to be aware of going in in terms of what they can contract maybe from the water. What do swimmers need to be aware of themselves in terms of the environmental impact they can have on the environment that they're swimming in? Well, a lot of that does also come down to location choice. And um, so really, I mean, the, the key thing is to leave a place as good as you found it or even better. Um, maybe that's not as easy, but if you're picking up litter, for example, if you're taking away rubbish that has been left there, that's a good way to do it. I would be wary about picking up uh, cans or glass because I have actually cut my hands doing that, you know, trying to clean up a place. So that's more of a kind of practical thing to be wary of. Um, but location choice. So choosing somewhere that, you know, is not going to cause too much erosion, for example, if you're getting in from a riverbank, as well as location choice. You know, is it somewhere that can handle a lot of people? If it is great maybe you can tell others about it but if it's you know a place that could couldn't handle a big footfall or lots of people going there maybe consider not telling too many people about it um what how you what have you got in yourself so if you're swimming if you're planning multiple swims in between different bodies of water especially if you're going between kind of water catchment areas the kind of the best advice is to you know for example your swimsuit is to 
clean it in fresh water and dry it fully before going to another body of water. So you're not taking any kind of any small parasites or things between different bodies of water in that way. So a uh, handy thing could be have multiple swimsuits with you if you're planning, you know, swims in different places on the same day. Um follow the, the countryside code or the Scottish outdoor access code if you're in Scotland as well. Um, a lot of it is kind of it's kind of straightforward common sense to some extent. Um, and I think just leaving a place as good or better than you found it when you got there. I mean, and that's one of the reasons that we, we want to go to these places, right, is to enjoy this beautiful environment, have that connection with nature. So it is we have a responsibility ourselves to ensure that one, we don't harm it, and two, we leave a, a positive trace rather than a negative trace or no trace at all. So, yeah, good good advice there. Um, so we've got a question for you uh, that links nicely onto the assessment that we were look, talking about earlier, and this is from Sarah Holdway. Um, what do you do if you get stuck in a strong current? She understands that in river, uh, sorry, in a, in a rip current, you swim across it, but what do you do if you're in a river current? Yeah, really good question. Uh, for anyone that might not know, a rip current would be a current or a tide that pulls you out, uh, often at a surf beach at the sea. So it feels like you're going to get pulled away and swimming sideways can get you out. That might not be an option in a river. So uh, a really key thing is looking before you get in. So looking how fast the water's going, choosing, for example, like Owen's saying, he does swims that go downstream. So you can go with the flow, even if it's potentially too strong to swim against. It's all about choosing where you could get out, you know, making sure there are bits of the river, maybe that basically there is no flow and that you know you could swim too safely. Um, if the river looks really high, really fast, there's lots of white water, it might not be, you know, probably don't get in. Um, so you're looking for places that you could swim to if you had to. So you, you're not swimming necessarily straight against the river. You're taking an angle to swim to the side of the river. Um, so going with the flow to some extent. If you're somewhere... Um, you'll find the water's taking you, you can swim defensively. So that's effectively lying on your back, feet first. So you're looking ahead of you and then you keep your arms out, your, your feet up in front of you, not sitting up too high because that causes your bum to drop and you could bounce off rocks. But that's a kind of way to help yourself then move to the side of a river and choosing somewhere to, to get out, you know, if you have to do that. I would say as well, if you're swimming in a river, sometimes in some situations, not having a tow float can be helpful or having the ability to get rid of it quickly. Um, because if you're going downstream, you've got this leash that can get caught on rocks potentially or trees and branches and things like that. Um, and also a very key thing, which is easy to say sitting at a computer here in the warmth, is to to not panic. So to, to stay calm. It's very easy to say that when you're suddenly in the situation, it can be a lot harder. But staying calm, even physically talking to yourself, saying, where can I go? What can I do? It gives you a lot more thinking time than if you were to start panicking and thrashing around. Staying calm gives you a whole lot more time to make decisions. Interesting. And then again, also like part, spotting some of these things being part of the evaluation that you make before you get into the water so that you're, you know, if, if something happens, you've already spotted where your exit points might be and what you'll do if something comes up. And um, Owen, your turn, mate. Um, you are, and this is a brilliant job title, the uh, OSS Inland Access Campaigner. Can you tell us what that means and what your role entails with that? So in a nutshell, the, in, it's called Inland Access because um, we look at accessing water inland. You know, generally the sea, um, there, there aren't too many no swimming signs at the beach and at the coast, but inland, um, the UK, um, you know, other than Scotland, where they do have, you know, really, really very good access to water um, in the rest of England, the Wales access to inland water is broadly very, very poor. And it's and it's very rare that you know that you have an undisputed right of access to water to swim in it. So we have uh, the, the inland access guide, which is a PDF that you can download for free from the OSS on the website. And uh, that. Uh, has great information for people that are wanting to set up inland bathing areas and then we have a Facebook group where people get in touch with their questions and we help and we help give them information and it's not just me there's lots there's, there's a whole team of us at, at the OSS who, who, who work on inland access uh, there's Imogen and Rob and, and lots of other people and they are like really geeky on it and they have really 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 good knowledge I don't have such great knowledge as they do and Imogen has a great website as well Imogen's River Swims 
where she has loads of the more nitty gritty information that you could delve into if you really want to um, to understand access. Yeah, because I was really surprised to find out that actually we've got very little, very limited access, river, riverside access. Like you can be in the water, but actually getting into and out of the water is the problem in the UK a lot. Yeah, th there is there is this kind of 3% statistic, which is, is kind of a bit questionable. It, I think it's 3% it's of, of, of UK rivers that we have undisputed right of access to. But but the rest of it doesn't mean that you don't have access. It just means that there's some great it, there's some kind of you know we're not really sure and it depends on interpretation of the law etc. But the point is yes rivers and a lot of inland water we don't have great access to it. But a lot of those places, you know, people have been swimming for years and years and years. Um, and if you were to go there in reality, or you were to bump into a landowner or, or the or the council or met the people who swim there. They wouldn't even be aware that they're technically not allowed to swim um that and that's the case around sheffield for example we have kind of three main spots where it was always just assumed oh we're allowed to swim here we've always swum here even the council on on their kind of website almost uh on on, on the outdoor city website was 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 saying oh this is where you can go and swim and then when i really looked into the nitty-gritty i was like oh, oh, oh you're not actually allowed to swim there um, which is kind of, you know, it's good for my point because I'm trying to talk about the problem of inland access. So when it when it goes to show that even, for example, on access land where we have the right to roam, so you know where we have the right to roam where you can walk freely off the footpath, that stops at water. You are not allowed to swim in water that's on access land, and um, and you know a lot of people didn't realise that. I didn't realise that for a long time until I really looked into the nitty gritty. So, yeah, that there, there is a, there is a big issue inland, but. That's not to say that you're going to go, that if you go off swimming, that you're going to have all the, all the finger wagging at you and tutting and people shouting at you, because actually that's, that's, that's only quite rare in, in reality, but, but it's still not good enough. And it's, you know, and it's not good when people need equal access to the countryside and we need to feel, you know, that we belong there and that we can go out and enjoy things just as we do on a footpath or just as we do on the coast. And again, it's something that's become people become more and more aware of after 2020, 2021 with the lockdowns and where our travel was restricted and, and people sort of almost rediscovered what was on their doorstep and what was nearby and, and what they could recreate in. And some of these issues then came came more to light. Um, another one of the, the sort of um, elements that you're working on is is accessing swimming in reservoirs. What's the the current situation with that? What and, and you know, is there a, is there are they inherently more dangerous swimming in rivers? So, uh, so for example, in Scotland, where they have where the right to roam extends to water, they have a legal right to swim in pretty much all of the reservoirs, um, and it's the same in lots of other European countries. You can swim in reservoirs pretty freely. Um, from all the research that I started to do, when, when I started to learn this and I started to really look at reservoirs, because I was terrified, you know, I, I had been, I would kind of, when I would swim in reservoirs, I used to kind of get in on the surface because I was too afraid to put my feet down. I thought, you know, I was going to get sucked into the big, scary gobble monster machinery and I'd kind of swim like a pancake on the surface and I would stay just at the very edge. You know, it was really just having a little dip. I would never swim off into the middle of it. I was absolutely terrified. Um, but, you know, the more that you learn, you realise that actually, away from the infrastructure, and, and this is on the Scottish Outdoor Access Code, um, it, they just say stay away from the infrastructure. So, you know, that's like the dam wall, the spillway, the tower, you know, any inlets and outlets that you can see near the surface. Broadly speaking, if you go to the far end of the reservoir, away from all the infrastructure, you're swimming from a shallow beach and you know and, and i just don't swim over you know anywhere near anywhere near any of the infrastructure and one really good thing about reservoirs is especially when you've had a drought the water level is really fun and you can go and walk around the empty reservoir and you can really see where, where are there hazards is there anything in here that would surprise me and that's something that we've been working on around sheffield there's a group of people who set up uh, a, a hazard map where everyone is going to these empty reservoirs and they're taking photos. And most of the time they're taking photos of nothing, just rocks, a few rocks, nothing, nothing there. But they're taking photos of what hazards there are. And we're sy systematically mapping the hazards in reservoirs so that we can actually say, oh, well, this is where the hazards are. So that it's not this kind of unknown of, 
don't swim in reservoirs because there's lusty things that you might bump into. Actually, we can say, well, actually, we've, oh, no, we've been and we've looked when it was empty and there was nothing in this one. This is good to know because I'm, I'm sure I've been terrified by horror stories or children's warning videos when I was little that like sort of made me even want to walk near a reservoir sometimes. Um, so you're also the founder, and this this link leads on quite nicely. We're going to open the floor to questions in a moment, but some of the questions we've had earlier about getting into swimming and, and how you how how you get started with it. And you're you're also the founder of the Sheffield Outdoor Plungers which is an outdoor swimming group. Um, how did that come about? Why, why did you set that up? Yeah, so Sheffield Outdoor Plungers, uh, soup as we call it, it's, um, uh, it started just about five years ago. It now has over 12,000 members uh, on Facebook, plus with the kind of extended like family through all of, uh, you know, WhatsApp groups and all these things. And I bump into all these people and they say, oh, I'm not on Facebook, but I'm on this WhatsApp group and that's joined to it. And I've got a friend and he does it for me and he sorts of in. So I think that if it's 12,000 people, it's maybe more like 24,000 people or 36,000 people. You know, it, it's kind of, it's really got fingers out into the community. But I, I just started, you know, I was just like, you know, th there wasn't a Facebook swimming group for Sheffield at the time. And there, and there probably wasn't one because there was almost nowhere that people really knew to swim. It was, there, as I say, there was just this tiny handful of three little swimming spots that were well established you know people have been swimming there for decades and they're like tiny little plunge pools and i had started swimming with a with a swimming group in leeds called flows and they were swimming in all these reservoirs and i was like well there's loads of reservoirs around sheffield as well and then i just started slowly exploring all these reservoirs learning more and more that actually reservoirs and are not necessarily dangerous places to swim and actually they're they're potentially some of the safest places to swim um and then I and then I yeah I, I set up the Facebook group and I started swimming in this little place in the city and I just wanted to share it. That's Crooks Valley Park in the centre of Sheffield. So I thought this, we've got all this on our doorstep. We've got all these kind of untapped swimming spots that, that no one's really discovering. And I just wanted to share it and invite people along. And I wanted to do it in a way that was kind of you know not shameful. A lot, sometimes with this kind of swimming in places you're not allowed, there's a kind of shamefulness to it. Are we setting a bad example? Are we going to cause problems? You know, are we doing environmental damage? And there's a lot of these questions, and, and, and you know, they're important questions for us to answer. And so I thought, no, we're going to do it. People need good information. Uh, in order to be responsible, then we need to have like a shared, you know, sense of, of being responsible and we can share that good information. Um, we're going to do it proudly because we're actually we're having a healthy lifestyle and we're helping people to engage with nature. And this is not something to be ashamed of. And actually, we'll set a really good example for young people and we'll give them good information. So it's just kind of, you know, we don't need to be tiptoeing around. We don't need code words and code names and keeping a secret and operating like spies in bushes. Actually, we can be very proud of what, of what we're doing. And, um, and, and I think that's really worked and people really got on board with it. And then, as we know, like, you know, like all the swimmers here, it's like drugs and then they get addicted and then they get all their friends hooked. So and that's how, and that's how it kind of went on. Well, joy is certainly contagious. And I can already see there's quite a lot of soup love happening in the chat at the moment. So you've got plenty of fans in, in the audience oh, tonight. Well, I must say, I must say, it, it, I, you know, I, I started it, but I, you know, it, it's a lot of, it's a lot of work goes into it, a lot of love goes into it. And that's all the other people who do it. That's all the other admins. There's a whole team of people. My, my partner, Mick, does it. Um, and there's a lot of people who put a lot of dedication into it. And also just the members themselves, you know, they, 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 they're what keep it so, so buzzing. And I think that's another thing that's really lovely about the outdoor, outdoor swimming kind of community is that it feels like quite a welcoming place that it's it's sort of a you know a group of people that that really enjoy and have a passion for something and they want to share that with people and they want to introduce people to it in a in a safe in a safe way and you sort of impart the essential skills that you need to do it safely but it's all about sharing and, and giving people that opportunity to experience that joy for themselves which is something that that sort of really speaks to me and I think to a lot of people out there so we've had loads of questions coming in we're going to do our best to get through them as much as we can so keep sending them in don't forget we've also got the um, OSS volunteers in the chat as well so they'll be answering your questions too so we'll do our best to get through as many as we can um Kate let's go back to you um we had one question earlier which is let me find out um yes yeah, so what kit do you need if you want to start whilst uh, outdoor swimming I think Kate's on silent. 
I'm on mute, sorry. Oh, yes. mute. <laughs> um, what kit do you need? Uh, very little. I think just be really comforted that you need very little. I mean, honestly, you can go swimming in your pants and dry yourself off with a T-shirt. So I don't think it should be a barrier. And that is honestly, I look at the early days of the OSS and that is a lot of that. People leading others by the hand that didn't know they were going swimming before they got to the riverbank that day and therefore are just semi-clothed. So um Really useful things when you get into it is obviously a nice swimming costume or, you know, one that you feel comfortable in and doesn't rub. Two pairs of goggles, one for bright, shiny conditions and one um, for cloudy days. Um, they're really super useful. You know, you're going swimming, you're going to see a lot, hope, well, definitely above the water, but hopefully underneath the water. So I think it's really worth thinking about your goggles, possibly not getting a tint on them because it's a bit of a shame to colour the whole natural world that you're just about to go and enjoy. Um, and from there, just build it up yourself. I mean, there are so many options for swimmers now. I mean, it, the, the world's gone crazy. So we've been talking about neoprene boots are really useful. Uh, super flexible swim wetsuit is really useful if, if you're the sort of person who gets cold or you want to go to do a distance. A, a brightly coloured swim hat is, you know, a great thing to have if you're swimming anywhere that there might be boat traffic or actually even if you're not, but there are other people around. People could get quite freaked out by the idea of a swimmer sort of bobbing around at the base of a cliff. But the minute you put your hat on, you've just sort of stated that you are in there intentionally, which is quite relaxing for spectators. Um, a tow float, tow floats are used far more than they need to be used, but they are really useful for taking your stuff from A to B or taking your car keys and your phone with you if you're a bit worried about leaving them on the bank and them not being safe, which to be honest, since things have got so popular, in the old days you used to just be able to pop it in a bush and, you know, be pretty sure it would be there when you got back. But there's so many people around now, which is great that I think a lot of people take their stuff with them. And the other good places for tow floats, if you're anywhere near boats um, or boat traffic or you know um, rowers or anything like that then um, make yourself as visible as possible you need to look out for them and they need to look out for you and it's just really helpful to make yourself more obvious. I mean as if I needed an excuse to go and buy some more brightly colourful hats now I've got <laughs> one and um, we've got another question from Tash Hayden uh, Tash says, I have just started. I've done one sea swim and one lake swim last weekend. But what are the signs you should be aware of that you should get out because you've gotten too cold? The adrenaline can sometimes mask that I'm too cold. Uh, Callum, would you like to answer that one for us? Yes, I would say that um, if you if we should just start a swimming, is that right? Yeah, just beginner yeah. speed two swims. Yeah, so I'd say really get out whilst you're still enjoying it, you know, keep your swims super short, especially this time of year, it's cold and it's getting colder still, and um, get out while you're still enjoying it, so whilst you think this is brilliant, get out then, and really habituation to cold water so that's getting being able to handle the cold effectively is something that takes quite a long time and if some people it comes within you know six seven swims some people can take weeks and months so really build up to it slowly i think um one thing that i find in winter and um, when i'm swimming with a wetsuit on obviously i can stay in a lot longer than i can without but I will notice that my pinky starts to kind of go wandering, so it won't connect up with the rest of my hand. And that's a sure sign for me that maybe it's time to get out. And that's to do with the cooling of a nerve in your arm, um, which affects how you can use your hands. I can still use my hands reasonably, but I can't quite get the pinky in. So for me, that's a good sign when I'm winning a wetsuit. Um, without a wetsuit, I'm usually getting out before that kind of time. But um, yeah, you get out whilst you're still enjoying it and learn about your body over time. So after a couple of swims, you know, after maybe you've done 10 swims, you might be able to stay in longer and you might understand more about yourself and the kind of the signs that you personally need and um, that it's time for you to get out. And do you need to, um, can you acclimatise, acclimate yourself using cold showers? Heidi Smith would like to know, you know, if you can, if you take loads of cold showers, does that help you with that, that cold water adaptation? 
Um, I don't think so, really. Uh, not in my. I mean, it's it's, it's a good thing to do to uh, understand how the cold feels for sure, but it's totally different to swimming. You're not fully immersed in it. There's, um, you're. It's not nearly the same experience. You're not getting the water surrounding you all the time. You know, you can move bits of your body in and out of the water, even subconsciously. You might not be. It, it's definitely worth doing taking cold showers if, for example, you kind of have a, a winter swimming goal and you're trying to swim regularly, but maybe you can't get outdoors every day it can be a good thing just to keep your body used to the cold um so in terms of that yes but it's definitely not a replacement for swimming in cold water i think it can be a good thing to kind of maybe keep yourself topped up to some extent okay cool and um, we've got a, another question from fiona staples uh, does it matter if you're a weaker swimmer and really poor at front crawl owen would you like to handle this one for us Sorry, could you repeat the question, please? Sure. Does it matter if you're a weaker swimmer? I'm really poor at front crawl from Fiona Staples. God, I don't, I don't even do front crawl. Um, I'm, I'm going, yeah, well, I'm glad. I hope not. Um, yeah, I, I just um, do whatever you want. You know, it's, you know, dance like no one's watching. I mean, so long as, so long as your head's above the water and, and, you, and you can breathe, then you can, you can do what you like. Um, no, I, I tend to kind of do, I, I find that, yeah, I, I don't do front crawl, partly because I'm kind of a bit skinny and my legs are probably a bit too heavy. And so my legs are always falling down. Um, I tend to do a bit of um, uh, brushstroke, but I kind of do it a bit strange with one arm like that and one arm over there. And then I do a lot of side stroke as well. So it's just whatever's most comfortable for you. You know, not all of us are doing big mammoth swims. I, I just like to get in and poodle around. I really am not, not interested in going far. And, and that for, for a lot of people, that's what it's all about. You know, it, it's make it your own. You, this is not a race. You do not need to be going anywhere. You can just get in to two foot of water and sit down if you want, because that's what I do half the time. Um, so, yeah, you, you can do whatever you like. If you want to learn to swim, by all means, you know, but a, a swimming pool is probably a better place to learn how to do fun. Um, but yeah, do whatever you like. <laughs> I like that. That's great. And um, one question, quick fire round for everybody. This is from Lauren Gray Kirtley. Salty or fresh? What's your preference, Owen? Oh, I'm mm, salty. <laughs> Callum? Yeah, it, it, mine's going to change. I'll say one thing today, one thing tomorrow. <laughs> fresh water, but uh, a nice clear river pool. Ah, okay. And Kate? completely can't choose I spent my whole life dedicated to rivers and I've had such amazing sea swims uh this summer that I think I've defected oh I like it you can, everyone can change their mind though as well so you know it's all good and it's good that we've got both and um, Kate I've got a question for you from if I can find it here uh about um open water swimming and pregnancy if if you're happy to answer that one or if anyone else would like to kick in on that one and I have totally lost the question, which is very unprofessional. Ah. Do you want me to take okay, it? So essentially, yeah. So, I mean, is it safe to go open water swimming, um, outdoor swimming, if you're pregnant? Um, well, obviously, I'm not a doctor. Uh, so no. I'm just going to, well, maybe not obviously, but I'm not a doctor. Um, I think there is a good feature on this on the OSS website. For the life of me, I can't actually remember what it says, but I can remember my own personal experience and that of other swimmers, which is, um, I think it's a bit, if you're talking about going in cold, I think it's a little bit like marathon or like being a runner, that if you were a really vigorous runner before you got pregnant and you carried on as you were pregnant, um, then then that seems to be absolutely fine for people. I mean, I've seen people break ice that are sort of nine months pregnant and at the Winter Swimming Championships, you know, nine months pregnant. So definitely there are swimmers out there. I don't know many women who would choose to start getting into really cold water when they're pregnant, just because it's not something that your body's used to. And that, that question for, was from Adita. Thank you very much for that, that question. Um, I mean, on that note, Kate, is there anything, because what um, outdoor swimming has... Um, had so much coverage I mean lately over over the last years particularly because you know the popularity that's increased the increase that we saw in 2020 but just generally as well and so it's it's getting a lot of media coverage is there anything that bugs you about how how outdoor swimming is portrayed there are there are a couple of things that bug me actually I think 
Owen and I've hopefully um, shown the many varieties of swimming that are out there from, you know, pottering about, to going long distance, to being an adventure swimmer. And um, there are just so many different types of people that swim in so many different ways. And that we've got a quite a, our own media narrative at the moment, which is lots of people swimming because of mental health and anxiety and depression and it's kind of excluding all the people who are swimming just for the pure fun of it and I think the thing that the thing that bugs me mostly about it is that a lot of swimmers just do it um because they love it and I think that's where the richness of it lies like if it's good for you I suspect it's just because you're intrinsically drawn to doing it in the first place and um and if we do it just because if we do it because we're good it we think it's good for us I'm worried that it's giving it a utility that it's turning it into something for our material benefit and I think honestly if we do that we're missing the whole magic of it in the first place which is just to sink down into the planet be part of nature part of things you know completely kind of connected and out of our normal mindsets and I think that's where the real richness lies and it's definitely not the kind of story that we're hearing but I would love I'm so glad that so many people have joined us and um I hope this is something that they'll find out of their swimming too and I'm seeing from the questions that are coming up that there is a, a huge variety of different experience levels preferences interests passions some people want to know about like how do I you know increase my long distance outdoor swimming speeds other people are more interested in just you know dipping and experiencing the water and then that, that's and that's one of the great great things about it as you said it, it's it's for everybody if they want it to be and it can be anything to you you just make it your own and um, so I've got another question for you Callum um, about swimming alone and particularly sea swimming alone so we've actually had this in twice so it's clearly something that quite a few people are interested in um, from Laura and from Denise and they both want to know is it safe to swim alone if they swim close to the shore? So I think maybe what Kate said earlier, there's not necessarily no such thing as a safe swim, but a safe swimmer. A lot of it, when it comes to the sea, might depend on the location. So there can be a vast difference between a big, wide, open beach, for example, or something so somewhere where there's a channel where fast water flows through. A great thing to do is research it beforehand, even as simple as finding out what time the tides are. Um, Ideally, maybe swimming as the tide is coming in, so you know you're not going to get swept out to sea. So that would be a little bit maybe before high tide, for example, or you always get a period of slack water around low tide, high tide, but you can never exactly predict when they're going to be. Um, I think if you choose somewhere that you know other people swim at, that's generally a good way to go about it. Um, ask other people. I find that um, speaking to kayakers is a great way actually to get information about swimming in the sea because very often they're maybe more um, risk averse than swimmers. So they really can give you a lot of good information. Um, and then from a swimming mindset, I can kind of work out, oh yeah, does that sound right to me? What could I do? Um, so I, I wouldn't want to give yes or no without knowing exactly where you were. And even then I might not know the place. So I think a lot of it comes down to, yeah, where you are. Um, choosing somewhere again you can get in and out of the water safely and looking at the tides looking at any information about rips you know currents do people surf there that kind of thing um, yeah, a lot of it comes down to location when it comes to the sea possibly okay so again it's oh and Kate yeah you've got something to add on that one um yes I think uh I think this thing about you've got to swim with someone I mean this is beginner's night right so I wouldn't necessarily go out as a newbie swimmer and swim on my own there's so much that you can learn from other people and there's so much that you can enjoy from being with other people but if we're going to narrow it down to just a um safety perspective um I think it's just a bit of a myth that you're necessarily safer if you swim with someone. There's a story in my book of when my sister and I got in a bit of trouble and I realised as we were offshore on the back of an island and uh, she wasn't really making progress against a tide that had turned a bit early that actually my chances of saving her were incredibly slim. Like, you know, if I, I remember how to do that sort of rescue stroke that you used to do in life saving at school. But, you know, if you can't make progress against a tide with both arms and legs involved, you're definitely not going to be able to do with towing a swimmer. So I think it might psychologically feel like you're safer with other swimmers, but actually you, you really just have to take responsibility for yourself. And like I said, I think it will make your swim more enjoyable, but I, I, I really think the chances of someone can actually help you are very, you know, 
I don't know what bother you're intending to get into, but um, it's, it's person in the water. Do you think there should be more um, more things in place to keep swimmers safe, or or should it always squarely be the responsibility of the swimmer in question? Should hundred percent, I would say, in the OSS opinion, be the responsibility of the swimmer safely. We want the right for people to swim freely, <clears throat> to swim freely without lifeguards, without rules, without payment, without anybody else deciding. We want the same rights of access that you know hikers have to hills and mountain bikers and cyclists and walkers, and we don't need looking after by someone else. But um, on that token, we we do have to learn how to look after ourselves and. Um, I'm going to hold my book up now, okay? Because this is 16 years of getting it wrong and being part of a conversation in the OSS community where we've all learned how to understand rivers, understand lakes, understand cold, understand how groups function e even, or, or, you know, what you do when things go a bit wrong and how you kind of mentally claw it back and, as Callum was saying, get that kind of space. So if you're beginning, I would say get something like this, or get something like this or join our community you know get get our monthly emails and um and just learn from other people and, and enjoy it fantastic thank you kate um oh and there's a question that i i'm particularly interested in here uh this is from joe mcclear uh joe i joe says i have just started swimming in the sea i'm always starving afterwards what you, what would you suggest i eat to stave off the hunger pains yeah i i, I mean i think there's a there's a little bit of myth in this thing about not eating before swimming, I think. And as I, I'm not a doctor, I've spoken to a few people who are GPs and, and they kind of agree with me. You don't eat a lot of heavy food before any kind of vigorous exercise or you will get a cramp. You know, that would be the same for running or, you know, Zumba or whatever, whatever it is that you're into. So, you know, I'm not going to eat like a th kind of three course meal and then go and do a marathon swim immediately. But I always I, I will never get into water hungry. This is, you know, one of the big things. I won't get into water, water cold. If I'm already cold, I'm not getting in. And if I'm hungry or thirsty, I'm not getting in. So be, you know, you, you want to have eaten, you know, maybe half an hour, an hour before, whatever feels best for you. I'll, I'll eat just before I go in. If I'm, if I'm not going to do any vigorous swimming, if I'm just getting into it, I'll eat just before I go in too. Um, so you make sure that your blood, you know, your blood sugar levels are high. You've got, you've got, you've got a good, you know, flapjack or some kind of good, good, um energy inside you and then and then when you get out then you're not having that kind of drop you, your body's not having to deal with the stress of cold water on top of the stress of not having anything in your tummy and then if you are you know and then once you're out you can you can eat whatever what whatever the hell you like you know you've earned that you can eat whatever you like once you get out i like this advice this is advice i can definitely subscribe to thank you for that <laughs> Um, so another question, and this is one for, for all of you, I think, as well. Um, has anyone ever been bitten by a pike? And that's from Sharon Lloyd. And a pike is, a, if I've got this right, it's a freshwater fish. And my only experience of this is my dad told me that when he was snorkeling in a lake in Ireland, he saw one through the mask and it scared the hell out of him. But he wasn't bitten. So Owen, bitten by a pike? Never. <laughs> Callum? No, and I, I do know some places that people swim regularly at, and there definitely are pike there. And I know that uh, none of the, none of them have ever been bitten. However, I think I would be wary about skinny dipping there personally. Um, yeah. Okay. Right. I'm not going to ask any more questions about that one. Um, Kate, any pike encounters? No pike encounters, but um, I have got a freaky summer encounter where I actually swam into a grass snake this summer. <gasps> So that was utterly horrifying. I was just, I was swimming on my own thinking I'm a big girl. Like I just said, I, you know, and I went to a new, new location. So it's probably a little bit more jangled. And I thought, I'm not really into this. I'm going to swim over to those brambles and really literally stick my head in nature and, you know, get into the whole experience. And then I looked up and there was just a snake just like right there in the water next to me. So I very much wish that I was with someone because I had another 40 minutes before I could tell anybody about the horrors that I had just been through. <laughs> Wow, close encounters of the snake kind. That doesn't doesn't sound ideal. Um, we are rapidly running out of time. Um, however, we have loads more questions coming in. So if everyone's up for it, should we stick around for another 10, 15 minutes and I'll answer a few more questions? 
that's a yeah, thumbs no up bother. from all our panelists so fantastic keep those questions coming we'll see how many more we can get through um so what else have we got so we've got another question that was sent in uh and uh, this one's for callum and actually this is perfect timing um if i want to swim with a head torch so i'm assuming night swimming at this point um which models can you recommend and how is waterproofness measured and rated <laughs> Well, it sounds quite a technical question, so I went and did a bit, <laughs> done a little bit of research. Um, yeah, night swimming is brilliant, by the way. If anyone's thinking about doing it, it can be a totally different experience to during the day. Um, so I would say what one handy thing for swimming at night is look at what the moon's doing. So if it's, it's if it can be a full moon, there's a chance it could be bright, and so you can see very clearly. Sometimes you don't need a head torch, um, and also maybe choose a location that you have seen during the daylight can be really handy for when you're swimming at night, especially things like tripping over rocks, really basic things like that. Um, so head torches, Alpkit do some very good head torches. There you go. Um, so for example, there's a, there's a standardized testing process. So you're looking, if you're buying a head torch, you're looking for something called IP. And if you see something that says IPX4, that's a head torch that's uh, watertight against splashes, but not going underwater but you're looking for something like ipx7 or 8 for a head torch that could go underwater has been rated um, watertight in immersion ideally i mean swimming at night i'm always swimming head up breaststroke pretty much um but you could get an alp kit prism sit that on top of your head and maybe don't go swimming in really wild water at night where you're risking your head torch getting you know damaged and um, choose somewhere where you can keep your head up maybe because it's all about the experience swimming at night. Doing front crawl at night can be really, really um, dizzying almost and disorientating. And I don't enjoy it personally, unless maybe you've got a kayaker with a torch in the water or something. Um, keep your head up and enjoy what's around you at night. It must be almost like flying, kind of, but supported by water, but with nothing around you. It's quite a yeah. magical experience. Yeah, it can be brilliant. And, and I would say quickly, um, if you, you live by the sea, um, swimming during summer when there's phosphorescence or a bioluminescent plankton can be quite a magical experience as well. That's I'm just adding that to my mental lifetime to-do list right now. Um, Owen, you've got uh, something to add to the night swimming conversation. Yeah, I, I have attended a lot of night swims on full moons where the moon was nowhere to be seen and it was, you know, it was going to rise at three in the morning or the moon was long gone. So a little bit of planning, looking at where the moon will be in the sky. I, I use an app. It's, it's aimed at photographers. It's called Sun Position. I'm going to very badly show it to you. And you can change the date on it. And I don't know if you can see, maybe you can't see it, but the sun, basically, it shows where the sun will be in the sky and the moon. And you can change the date. So you can think, oh, where will the moon actually be at this time of day when I'm there? And then if you're ever in that location, you can point it at the sky and think, what time of what what time of year will I get the perfect sunrise at six in the morning? And you can work all these things out, so you can start planning your your, your life around around your swim spots and swimming at sunrise and sunset and moonrise and when the moon will be high in the sky. So just that little bit of information, yeah. That sounds amazing. We'll definitely share the link to that if we can in the chat as well. And Kate, what what would you like to add? Yeah, as you can tell, we're all very keen night swimmers here. With <laughs> I just one thing I'd like to add is that um, a lot of the information that we're giving out tonight is on our website. There's a survive section that's got lots of different features on all the different things that we've spoken about tonight. And there is a whole feature. Well, there's a couple of features on night swimming, but there's one that we did recently. And in terms of the head torch, um, fantastic advice there from uh, Callum. But the other thing to consider is just embracing the fact that there is an absence of light because the real it takes like 20 to 40 minutes for your eyes to adjust to the dark and if you can be in a situation where you haven't looked at a screen and you haven't looked at you know a head torch or and you actually quite adjusted before you go in the water you can see so much more you you can have a view of the stars and you can see the moon and um I think the other thing about head torches to consider is are you going to be blinding someone else because now swimming's got so popular I did a swim with some friends last summer and our little river was like a, a, a motorway basically so we were going up and swimmers were coming down with these caving torches it would like burn out your retinas and then you couldn't see anything <laughs> so, so yeah I mean I would consider it's often very useful to illuminate the way out it can be harder to find your way back to a spot in the dark so some gentle illumination there can be really really helpful um, but you it depends where you are but you might not need a light. 
Excellent. Okay, that's great. Great advice. Thank you for that. And I'm definitely going to try and do some night swimming if I can. Um, another question for you, Owen. Um, this is from Claire. Do you still get the same benefits if you wear a wetsuit whilst winter dipping? Well, do you know, I don't really wear a wetsuit. I have I have tried wetsuits a good number of times. I would say it's kind of just a different thing. It's kind of a different thing. You you will get a lot of the benefits because you do get bloody freezing. Um, and, and if that's what's giving you the benefits, then you can still do that. But I would say with a wetsuit, it's it's a very different thing. I, I, I much prefer without a wetsuit, to be honest, because you kind of get in, you get your hit, and then you get out again. Whereas with a wetsuit, um, it's a, you kind of have this slow trickle into the into it, and then you can get you can warm up quite a bit within it, um, especially if it's quite a thick wetsuit. Um, I would say yes. A lot of people would say you do get the benefit, but it, it is a different kettle of fish. And actually, people that I know who've got into trouble in winter have often been in wetsuits because they didn't quite realise how cold they were getting and that they were staying in too long. Um, whereas when you're not in a wetsuit, you you know it's much more immediate and you're much more acutely aware um of how long you've been in the water and how you're feeling and that you might need to get out so yeah okay so again it's a, a question of sort of working out what works for you um there's you know there's no particular rules on it but just know yourself and know how you react to these things um i guess also the flip side of this one and this is for you callum um this is from helena um will swimming in a heated pool reverse the cold water acclimatization that i've done so far well, I don't swim in heated pools all that often, so <laughs> maybe I'm not the best person to ask on that. Um, I think I think uh, using pools all year for training purposes is actually really good. Um, will it reverse? I don't know because I don't swim in warm water enough to actually to to know. Yeah, I'm not totally sure. Maybe someone else has got has got an idea yeah, I, on that. Well, I know Kate does. So, and Kate, we were we were talking about the surgery as well. Like, do, I mean, do do outdoor swimmers even? Do you even bother with pools anymore? Or are you all about the outdoors? And 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 would it reverse your acclimatization if you if you did go for the indoor swim? Um, yes, yes, I would say uh, from 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 what I've read, I was trying to find another book on my shelves, which is called Modern Ling Long Distance Swimming by Gerald Forsberg, which was written in 1963 when he thought everyone was going to get into this thing, and obviously it's taken another 60 years. But he. Um, he writes a lot, he does all his training in winter in a pool, and then he writes very much about that adjustment process where you have to get back to your long distance swimming um, in summer and you have to acclimatise. So if you really want to harden yourself to cold, I mean, channel swimmers make it an entire lifestyle thing, you know, swim, sleeping with the windows open, you know, wearing a t-shirt in winter, you know, just generally making the cold a way of life. And anything you do like working in this office with a log burner which obviously makes it like a sauna in here on a daily basis or doing my swim training in a pool any of those things takes your body in the other direction and um so yeah i think if you're really serious about adjusting to cold then um then it makes it slightly harder but i mean i love swimming in a pool during winter because I really like keeping up my swim fitness and I like the whole athleticism of swimming and I can't put my face in water once it reaches a certain temperature the fun's gone for me and I can't spend the time in it so you know I'm not I'm not it's not something you necessarily have to be put off I still jump in, in into cold water in winter I'm just maybe not as good at it as those people who don't don't get hot so often okay um on that note then um so we had a question from paul who wants to know how can you realize swim speeds in open water consistently closer to swimming pool speeds when in smooth conditions kate is that something you can help with so if you want to get the same speeds or close to the same speeds in open water as you can in the pool how do you do that is it possible um I, I, to be fair, I don't time myself uh, uh, that that way. So, um, so I would say you need to use a pool if you want to work on your speed. But I'm not quite sure why he won't be getting the same speed results in open water in flat conditions as he is in a pool, unless the pushing off is giving an artificial speed enhancement. Sorry, I don't actually know the answer to that one. No, no, that's fine. I, I think we've got loads of questions coming in, unless Callum and Owen would like to add to that one. Well, we can come back to that one in the chat. Callum, you've got something to add? Um, yeah, I would say that, uh, well, if you swim in the sea, you're much more buoyant. So if, you, if you're swimming outdoors in fresh water, that's potentially maybe what's not, not making you so fast. Um, I 
almost swim just as fast outdoors as I do indoors, but maybe that's because I'm actually enjoying it. Maybe, and I, I do, not that I dislike swimming indoors, but it's it's just a different experience that I don't get joy out of maybe. Um, so for me, my swim speed outdoors pretty much matches indoor. And I think pushing off the wall is cheating because uh, I every day I'm swimming indoors, I'm thinking of it as preparation for, you know, for swimming outdoors, for even if it's for an event or for a race. So I try not to push off the wall if I can, so that I'm actually swimming more and not kicking. Excellent oh. advice. Thank you for that, Callum. Um, oh, we've got another question for you from Anne Nixon that was sent in in advance. Um, although if anyone else wants to pitch in with this one as well, because I'm guessing that everyone will have their own perspectives on this. Um, what's the best wetsuit gloves and socks to buy for winter swimming? Well, maybe not the wetsuit part of this one for you, <laughs> but you know, if you, you wear gloves and socks, um, that's not too expensive. Um, so for example, what do other people in, in, your, in, the, in the soup swimmers use? So I actually prepared for this, I've got them here. Um, I would say, I, I understand that you don't want to spend much, and but the you know buy 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 good once it's it's the cheapest way to do it i definitely bought cheap uh they didn't last they didn't fit very well they weren't warm enough they got holes in them and they just kind of flopped around on the end of my hand um i bought um c skins so c the letter the letter c skins and i get the five millimeter gloves and the five millimeter socks uh my, my partner's just got, got the the um the little uh, like lobster claw ones so you can get lobster claw because they've got a few less bits in between the fingers to eventually rip through i take really good care of them i don't i try not to walk on the ground with the socks so they don't get holes in them I try and wear crocs or, or sandals or something like that um and i take good care taking them on and off uh, keep them clean um take just take really good care of them i do dry them on the radiator i don't know if that's um naughty naughty in terms of neoprene care but i do dry them on a radiator um yeah, and then wetsuit, and someone else might have, have some advice. Any other favourite bits of kit? Kit, Kate, yeah, what, what would you recommend? Well, outkit. I mean, <laughs> as if by magic. I am, I am a, I'm a massive fan. Behave, Kate, of... behave. <laughs> Um, it's true. It's absolutely true. They've got a great Terrapin natural buoyancy wetsuit. There's a uh, thermal silver tip, which um, which some of the OSS team are seen sporting even in midsummer. Um, and some very reasonably priced accessories. I mean, there's so much kit out there, honestly. But um, uh, I can't now remember what the question, what brand. I tell you another thing. We talk about Swift kit in winter swimming and what exactly what Owen was saying, that actually putting a whole wetsuit on can be worse. But what has been invented, particularly for women, we seem to be ahead on the, the men's kit at the moment, is like Outkit have got a swimming suit made of a connell. So it's re recycled fishing nets, £35 or £36, and it's got a thermal front. Uh, so there's lots of kind of neoprene swimming costumes or slightly thermally lined swimming costumes. So it feels like you're doing the whole thing. You still get that nice cold shot that Owen and what we've all been talking about, but actually you just something's make it a little bit easier to go for a little bit longer, which is nice. Fantastic. So, and yeah, as you said, lots of products out there. Have a look uh, for, for the ones that fit in with your price range. But as Owen suggested, find a good quality one, make the investment, and don't and don't, and then then you're sorted for longer with a good quality a piece of kit. And um, we are basically out of time, so I have one more question, a uh, quick fire round for each of our amazing guests and thank you so much to everyone that sent in questions because they've been fantastic i know we haven't got around to all of them but i, I can see the uh, oss team hard at work in the comments there answering as many as we possibly can before we finish so thank you very much to the team there as well so our final quick fire round and that is one thing you wish you'd known as a beginner outdoor swimmer and owen i'm going to pick on you first i i, I just spent a long time getting in and having very very short swims i didn't know that that if you waited till you caught your breath after a minute or two that actually you could have a really nice few minutes in the water feeling calm and serene and enjoying it i just kind of was having this oh you know shake it all about blitz you know kind of put your head in the freezer moment but actually yeah take a bit of time i wish i'd known that i for, for about 10 years since i was about 15 years old i was kind of swimming just like that in the middle of winter one minute in the water Brilliant. Okay, fantastic. Callum, what's your piece of advice? I think um, how useful and how powerful 
positive self-talk is. So a lot of the time when it's cold, getting into the water can be the hardest thing. You know, getting over that mental hurdle and actually physically talking to yourself out loud, you know, talking through whatever's annoying you. Um, sometimes, you know, I, I kind of take on like a persona when I'm getting in the water of like uh, almost like a kind of a preacher and that whole positiveness and the whole telling yourself you can do it really does help with the getting in and maybe can trick your mind into forgetting that it's cold so I think the positiveness of that and also then that exudes onto other people and then you get into you get into a habit of doing it maybe as well so I think um, keeping a positive mindset when it's cold knowing how powerful that is uh, that's something I'd like to have known at the start because at the start you can be oh, you, you can let the little small gripes get on top of you but positivity and um, being powerful about it can wipe them all away. I feel like that's good advice for life in general as well as outdoor swimming. Fantastic. And Kate, finish us off. What, uh, what, thing, what one thing do you wish you'd known when you began your outdoor swimming journey? Um, I began it when I was so young that I don't think I knew anything. So I don't know that I can answer that kind of question. I just, like many kids, I just started when I was really, really young and I just guess I'm just never really stopped. But the one thing that I'd like to pass on is um, if you can find yourself an amazing swim buddy. I think like this OSS team that we've got here tonight, I mean, we're, we're a very loose sort of, we're a different type of friendship maybe than you find in other avenues of your life everyone's bound bound together by this kind of common mission <clears throat> and a common passion and it is such an enriching community to be part of so I've got that kind of big international web now of you know over hundreds of thousands of people that are kind of connected to us and we see these photos of you know people in their kelp forest in South Africa or turning to the rivers of California during lockdown and it's it's all very life enriching so find yourself a community and I guess find yourself a swim buddy without um, somebody that I met in the Thames in 2006 I probably wouldn't have set up the OSS probably wouldn't have written either of my books and um, I'm just so really grateful for that so Share the swim love is, you know, something that we, we we really do believe quite passionately. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kate. And Rob, over cool. to you to finish off our evening. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to come on to the prize winning in a moment. But before that, I just want to say a real big thank you to you, Aoife, for, for, for hosting tonight. It's been wonderful. Um, do follow um, Aoife's podcast. If anyone wants to kind of hear more of this type of stuff, Aoife's podcast, Spin Drift, is, is brilliant. And there's a new episode kind of about to land on that as well. So keep your eyes out for that. So Spin Drift, you can get that wherever you listen to your podcasts. Um, and if you want to follow what Aoife's doing, um, she's on Instagram, Silver Strange. Uh, beyond me, I don't know. It, it was, it's from the old days of the internet when that's in my favorite <laughs> idea. Um, also, uh, thank you to Kate. A huge, huge thank you to Kate. Um, seriously, buy Kate's book. It's called The Outdoor Swimmer's Handbook. Um, I'll give you a tip if you're going to buy Kate's book. If you want to save, save some money on it. Um, it's the only time I'm going to say this tonight. Um, Alpkit, we've got a sale on at the moment. There's sales on all over the place. We've got one on. You can get it for £17.99 um, on Alpkit at the moment. Um, so go and buy Kate's book. Um, and the other thing is check... As it, Kate's been saying, do check out the Outdoor Swimming Society. Become a member, donate. It's just the, what the Outdoor Swimming Society does is amazing. And I felt really moved actually seeing the team answering all the questions tonight. It's been really, really wonderful to be together. Um, and Callum, um, thank you too as well. Um, after you've bought Kate's book, Callum's got a good book as well. Um, uh, someone else has mentioned it tonight, 1001. Um, outdoor swimming tips that's published by uh, really good friends of ours over at uh, vertebrate publishing and you can follow what callum does at callum Mac on, on instagram and then finally owen thank you so so much it's been so entertaining having you on thank you thank you thank you um if you've enjoyed this uh this night and you like this sort of thing there's another event coming up next week uh, that's part of the sheffield adventure film festival and it's a um it's a a, a she Sheffield Outdoor Plunges Online talk about access to Yorkshire water reservoirs. Really, really interesting about how much um, kind of Owen and the team have, um, are making changes there. So there'll be four people talking all about access to those reservoirs. Um, it's easy to remember the night of this because it's the same as my mum's birthday. It's the 28th of November um, at half past seven. Um, so uh, do go along to that if, if you're interested. Um, 
And finally, thank you, thank you to the uh, Outdoor Swimming Society team uh, tonight answering all the questions. Uh, as I say, I, I feel quite moved actually, thank you. On to the winners. I say winners because I've kind of been, um, uh, I was so warmed by one of the questions because it was so close to my heart. I wanted to add an extra one. But the winner of Kate's book tonight, and you won't have to go and buy this now, is and for, she, for your question on the pike, Sharon, Sharon Lloyd, congratulations on winning uh, the Outdoor Swimmers Handbook by Kate Rue. And special prize um, that I've decided, uh, outkit t-shirt heading your way, Joe McClear. I'm always starving when I'm swimming. I only need to swim about 20 meters. I need to have a bowl of Weetabix. So thank you very, very much um, for those questions. If you, um, uh, Joe and Sharon, could email me your details to moments at outkit.com, that'd be fantastic and we'll sort you out those prizes. And finally, thank you to everyone who's joined us tonight. There's a million things you could be doing, um, but you spending the time with us and we really, really, really appreciate it. And it's 19 minutes past eight. It's dark. There's time for us to go for a night swim. Um, yeah, so let's do that. Right, very, very good. So thank you, everyone. I'm going to leave it there um, and we'll share a bit of the information from this afterwards. Everyone will email you in the next few days. Thank you very much. We'll see you all soon. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. So Bye. Thanks so much. Cheers. <laughs>